Good morning, kids. Welcome to another presentation on Presidents 11 through 15. So we are still in the antebellum era. In fact, we've got about 16 years of presidents going from 1845 to 1861, which is a good place to stop because from there we will go into the Civil War. So let's recap the presidents that we've looked at already. So we began with George Washington, then we had John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, or I'm sorry, James Madison, James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, William Harrison for one year, or actually less than that, and John Tyler. So that's a review of Presidents 1 through 10. We spent some time talking about the problems of antebellum America. Uh, the main problem of antebellum America, to be quite honest with you, is slavery. The Missouri Compromise reached in 1820, signed by um, James Monroe, basically meant that Maine was admitted as a free state and Missouri was a, admitted as a slave state, but there would be no slavery north of the 36th parallel. So the US map was sort of drawn out. There was a lot of fights over where you could have slave states, where you could not have slaves. So this was a constant battle. And as we're gonna see, there's gonna be another compromise, the compromise of 1850, where the United States is gonna have to figure out what's going on after the Mexican-American War between 1846 and 1848. So what's gonna happen with all that territory and the slaves that are gonna come in there? So the major issue in antebellum America is the problem of slavery. And this, as we see, will have a lot to do with what's going on with these presidents leading up to the outbreak of the Civil War. So let's go and remember real quick what these mean. So the background, so we're looking at the background of these presidents. Where do they come from? The domestic policy. Domestic policy is how do they do things at home? And remember, you always have these two party, this two-party system where some, some parties want a big government and other parties want a small government. So in the beginning, uh, the Federalists were the party of big government and the Democratic Republicans uh, were the party of small government. And then, of course, we have the foreign policy. So foreign policy, what is going on outside of the country. So domestic, what's at home? foreign, what's out there in the world, outside of the United States. So let's begin. We're going to talk about James K. Polk. Okay. Let's talk about him. James Polk was born in a log cabin in Pineville, North Carolina. He studied law and had a reputation as a good public speaker, and he decided to go into politics. He was elected to Congress at the age of 29. In Congress, he was a strong supporter of Andrew Jackson. He got elected as Speaker of the House in 1835, and the Speaker of the House presides over the meetings of the House of Representatives. As the Speaker, he imposed the gag rule in talking about slavery. I think we talked about that with the last set of presidents, this gag rule that's prohibiting people talking about slavery. And if we remember Andrew, I'm sorry, uh, John Quincy Adams didn't like that. He was definitely on the side of trying to stop the spread of slavery. But this gag rule means let's not talk about it. Doesn't seem to be very helpful, but that's what was happening. Let's talk about his domestic policy. He had, James K. Polk had four distinct goals when he became president. He wanted to reduce tariffs. He wanted to reestablish the independent treasury system. He wanted the Oregon Territory, and he wanted to get California from Mexico. He accomplished all of those goals in one term. He allowed Texas to be admitted into the Union in 1845, and as a general rule, this period of westward expansion in the United States was called a time of manifest destiny. This is important. This is the idea that, oh, it's just our destiny to go from coast to coast. It's our destiny to take these lands and make them our own. So this is the idea of manifest destiny under James K. Polk and even earlier presidents, this idea that this land was um, granted to uh, the United States by God was a very common theme in the antebellum period. It's the idea that, well, we're here, we have it, and therefore it's God that has ordained us to have this. So a very interesting theological justification there. All right, so let's look at his foreign policy. The Oregon Territory was a disputed area of land held jointly by the United States and Britain. 
Polk and the Democrats wanted the land badly. They made it clear that they were willing to fight for the land. Britain backed down and allowed the United States to have all the land beneath the 49th parallel. Polk also wanted to buy California from Mexico, but Mexico was not interested. He sent General Zachary Taylor, remember that name, into disputed territory on the border to push the issues. Hostilities, or fighting, broke out, which became the Mexican-American War. The U.S. won the war and acquired the land. Mexico was given $15 million. And so James K. Polk was president from 1845 to 1849. And I think I am forgetting to show you these cards. I'm not sure. So here is his background. You can always pause the video, take a look. Here is domestic policy. Here is foreign policy. And yeah, so years for filling out your presidential sheets. Yes, he was president from 1845 to 1849. Let's look at some fun facts, if I can find any here. He was, at the time, at the age of 49, the youngest man ever to be elected to the presidency. Okay, studied law in North Carolina. Supported Andrew Jackson. We talked about this. In 1846, he succeeded in reducing tariffs through the Walker Tariff Act, which would usher in an era of free trade. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Oregon. Okay. So there's our friend James K. Polk. Let's talk about the next president. Hmm. I told you to remember the name. Zachary Taylor. Okay. And he was president from 1849 to 1850. Zachary Taylor's father was a lieutenant colonel during the American Revolution. He decided to go into the military as well. He distinguished himself during the War of 1812. This is a common feature, this War of 1812, making these uh, military careers and then these men later becoming presidents. Um, he, decide, uh, he was in command during the siege of Fort Harrison, which ended in U.S. victory. He became a household name during the Mexican-American War. Taylor won many battles and even managed to capture the city of Monterey, which was considered impregnable. So he was a war hero in the Mexican-American War. Let's talk about his domestic policy. Gold was discovered in California right after the Mexican-American War. This led to a gold rush. A lot of settlers moved to the new territory to make their fortune. This caused a lot of political pressure for California to be admitted as a state. President Taylor, although a slave owner, did not want California to be a slave state. And he died only after 16 months in office. His death was caused by an unknown digestive ailment. And it looks like his presidency, 1849, that was the time of the 49ers. I don't know how many of you are familiar with football, American football, but there is a team called the San Francisco 49ers. That is in honor of the gold rush to California in 1849. So here is his domestic policy. All right, foreign policy. Taylor supported the revolutions of 1848 in Germany and Hungary. However, he only supported them with his words. He did not send them any actual help to remove their aristocratic rulers. He did not support the Venezuelan Narciso Lopez with his attempts at liberating Cuba from Spain. Lopez tried to gather funding and support in the United States for his expeditions. Taylor tried to have him and his followers arrested. So this is a, uh, another theme in uh, U.S. relations with other countries at this point in our history. There's this sort of isolationist streak where we kind of just want to be left alone during this time. Uh, and that is a, a theme that runs through from the very beginning. Some are more isolationist than others. Taylor seems to be on that end of the spectrum. All right, so Taylor, president from 1849 to 1850. Let's look at some fun facts here. His vice president was Millard Fillmore. Obviously, he's going to be the next president. He's a Whig. Oh, <laughs> He had never actually ever voted in a presidential election, uh, and he really had no knowledge of the political process. He was a military man. Uh, he grew up in Louisville. In the War of 1812, he served under General William Henry Harrison. 
He was promoted to a major in 1816 by President Madison. He defended the Western frontier during the Black Hawk War of 1832, and Abraham Lincoln served under him. All right, some interesting facts. Very, very much a military man. The Mexican-American War. Ooh, the high point of his administration was the signing of the clayton Dueler Treaty with Britain, establishing joint control of any canal built across the Central American Isthmus and paving the way for the Panama Canal 50 years down the line. He also did not want an unregulated expansion of slavery, and he recommended that California be admitted as a free state. Okay, Very interesting. He died, it says here he died of cholera contracted during a 4th of July celebration, during which he laid a cornerstone for the Washington Monument. So we've got two theories. we got digestive and we've got cholera. Uh, goes to show you that in the, uh, even U.S. presidents, we don't know exactly what they've died from sometimes, even with the best of records that we keep uh, at this time. So cholera, digestive issue, we are not sure. And again, he was president from 1849 to 1850. Let's talk about his vice president, also a Whig, Millard Fillmore. <clears throat> all, that, all right. As a young politician, Fillmore was part of the Whig Party. He op opposed letting Texas join the Union as a slave state, which was in 1845. He wanted to end the slave trade between states. He also wanted slavery excluded from the District of Columbia. Although Fillmore was against slavery, he was not an abolitionist. He was considered a, moderus, a moderate, and he was elected as vice president between because he was a moderate. He became the 13th, pre 13th president after Taylor died in office. I also learned that he grew up in rather poor conditions and that uh, he, uh, a lot of his early learning in his life is because he went to a public library. So the power of the public library in the life of Millard Fillmore. All right, so let's talk about his domestic policy. When Fillmore took office, he replaced Taylor's cabinet with men of his own. It was believed that Taylor was against allowing in any new states. Fillmore, with the Compromise of 1850, allowed Texas to enter the Union as a slave state, and the people of Utah and Mexico were allowed to choose if they wanted slavery. California entered the Union as a free state. The District of Columbia would be free of slavery as well. So this is a very important moment I talked about at the Compromise of 1850. And in fact, Texas' northern and western borders would be the boundary for slavery moving forward. Uh, another very important thing that happened here, again, all these compromises, all this stuff happening, the Fugitive Slave Law. Some of us did a field trip. We learned a lot about the Fugitive Slave Law. The Fugitive Slave Law was passed as a part of a deal to get the Compromise of 1850 passed. Abolitionists, those who wanted to get rid of slavery, referred to it as the Bloodhound Law. This required people living in free states to return runaway slaves. If they did not, then they would be fined $1,000. And $1,000 in those days was a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Uh, if I had to look at any of the cards that we're doing here with these presidents, this card is probably the most important one because the Compromise of 1850, the Fugitive Slave Law, these are, in, these are just indicative of what's going on in the country. There is a lot of disagreement. There's a lot of infighting. You have abolitionists. You have pro-slavery advocates, you have people like Fillmore who's uh, seemingly in the middle. If there is a middle ground, who knows? There is a lot of conflict. Things are brewing. And so I'm going to hold this one up here. This one is probably the most important card in the entire section here. All right, so let's talk about Fillmore's foreign policy. He wanted to open up trade relations with Japan. American merchants wanted to trade with Japan and be able to use the country as a port in Asia. However, Japan was hostile to foreigners at the time, and Fillmore sent Commodore Matthew Perry to persuade them. <laughs> Perry was able to persuade them, I'm not sure if it's persuasion, by using the threat of force. Yes, this is a very famous moment, East meets West, with uh, Commodore Matthew Perry going to Japan. Southern slave owners wanted to take Cuba from Spain and make it a slave state. Some of these Southerners supported Narciso Lopez in his attempt to do this. Fillmore was against this plan, and he wanted those conspirators arrested. So there's some stuff going on down in the Caribbean area as well. 
All right. So let's learn a little bit more about Fillmore, who was president from 1850 to 1853. So. It says, although Millard Fillmore could probably never have won the presidency on his own, in the extreme situation, when Zachary Taylor died in office, he proved a competent, level-headed leader. Though personally opposing slavery, Fillmore took care to stand on a middle ground. On a middle ground, he believed the issue quite simply not worth a civil war. Okay, well, it eventually did happen. Yep, Fillmore uh, took learning into his own hands. Age of eighteen, joined a public library. He would later recall speaking of his how book save soon came to fill his days. I read enough to see the need of a better knowledge of the definitions of words. I therefore bought a small dictionary and determined to seek out the meaning of every word occurring in my reading, which I did not understand. Wow, that's really interesting. I tell my students that all the time. Look up words in dictionaries that you don't know. Okay. Commodore Perry again. Yep. All right, so that is my friend Millard Fillmore, a moderate, considered a moderate at the time. Let's talk about the next president. This would be Franklin Pierce. Let's get back here a little bit. All right, Franklin Pierce's father fought in the American Revolution and was a prominent, and was a prominent Democratic Republican. At college, he made close friends with the author Nathaniel Hawthorne and they remained friends throughout their lives. Pierce was elected to the House and later the Senate. He was a Democrat who strongly resisted big spending by the government. So remember, the Whigs at this time are still the party of big government, and the Democrats are the party of small government. Although he said he did not like slavery, he saw abolitionism as a greater threat to the Union. Very interesting. For those of us that did that field trip, we kind of recall that there were people that were making this argument, uh, this constitutionalist argument, that we have to let the laws change slowly over time, and that the actions of the abolitionists are actually making things worse. So this is, uh, you know, I'm just hearing a lot of the speakers from that field trip as I read these cards leading up to the Civil War here in antebellum America. Pierce wanted to fight in a war like his father. He took the opportunity during the Mexican-American War. Here's a fun story. He was not much of a soldier. He had an embarrassing incident when his horse fell on him. Is interesting. Now, I guess the equivalent nowadays would be uh, having you uh, get out of your car with it in reverse and then it hits the back of the garage, uh, something like that. Uh, again, horse is the most important means of transportation at the time. All right, so the domestic policy of Pierce. During Pierce's presidency, there was a big debate about what to do with the Kansas and Nebraska territory. Southerners wanted more land for slave plantations. Northerners and Free Soil supporters did not want any more slave states. The Kansas-Nebraska Act passed in 1854. This law said that it would be up to the settlers of these lands to decide whether they were a slave or free state. This led to a groups of people swarming into these territories to ensure they became a slave or free state. These settlers had a series of violent conflicts known as Bleeding Kansas. John Brown became known as a national figure who would fight the growth of slavery with physical force. John Brown, a very famous abolitionist. The debate about slavery became so hostile that violence even broke out in the Senate chamber. Preston Brooks attach, attacked Charles Sumner with his cane. So if Millard Fillmore's domestic policy is <clears throat> the most important card, this is definitely very close because we've got bleeding Kansas, we've got John Brown using violence to end slavery, we've got people using violence to promote slavery, we have Congressmen fighting, senators fighting in Congress. Wow. So U.S. history, things are really, really, really becoming uh, heated with respect to the issue of slavery. It's very, very important to remember this during this antebellum time period. All right, let's look at the foreign policy of Pierce. Pierce acquired more land from Mexico with the Gadsden Purchase. The area of land in New Mexico and Arizona was needed to run a railroad line through. It was purchased for $10 million. Pierce supported the aggressive expansion of the United States that was taking place. He chose expansionists to work in his cabinet, like James Buchanan. James Buchanan proposed a document called the Ostend Manifesto, 
This was a proposal to purchase Cuba from Spain or take it by force. Pierce rejected the idea after the bloodshed in Kansas. Didn't want to have any more uh, bloodshed under his presidency. So there's that card on the foreign policy of Franklin Pierce. All right, so Pierce was president from 1853 to 1857. Okay. He became a lawyer in New Hampshire in 1827. Other interesting things here. 1829, elected to the state legislator. He was a supporter of Andrew Jackson. He was elected to the Senate in 1837, and he was only 33 at the time. He enlisted in the Mexican War as a private. Pierce's administration was beset by problems. His pressing for passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854 which gave popular sovereignty to the people of those places to choose, provoked bloodshed between settlers over the slavery issue and led to the founding of the abolitionist Republican Party. His attempts to acquire Cuba from Spain did not work as well. We talked about the Gazden Purchase. All right, so there is our friend Franklin Pierce, Democrat, 1853 to 1857. All right, let's talk about our last president in this set, James Buchanan. Okay, let's talk about his background. James Buchanan was born in a log cabin in Cove Gap, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. He studied law as a young man. He was a Federalist in his politics until the Federalist Party disbanded or broke apart. He did not support the War of 1812, but he just did choose to help fight in the war once it began. He later became a Democrat and served as Secretary of State under James Polk. He helped negotiate the Oregon Treaty with Britain. The Democrats nominated him as president in 1856. This was because he was out of the country during the Kansas-Nebraska feud period. This made him appear to be an impartial figure. Wow, it looks like bleeding Kansas situation was a major national issue at the time. All right, during Buchanan's presidency, presidency Dred Scott, this is the famous Dred Scott case, sued for his freedom. He was taken to a free state, and so he tried to sue for his freedom. The Supreme Court, which was dominated by Southerners, decided against Scott. They also declared that African Americans, whether enslaved or free, are not citizens and cannot sue. Buchanan secretly supported the decision and urged the court to make such a sweeping declaration. He did this because he was hoping that this would put an end to the slavery debate. He hoped people would finally accept that slavery was here to stay. Buchanan supported the Lecompton Constitution, which would allow Kansas to become a slave state. This constitution was even opposed by pro-slavery advocates such as Stephen Douglas for not putting the issue to a vote. Later, Kansas would be admitted as a free state in 1861. So again, the domestic policy is dominating politics at this time, like the domestic issues that are going on during the presidency of Fillmore and Pierce. The Dred Scott case is basically demonstrating that we've got a president here who's trying to tell people pre that slavery is here to stay, but yet we have the rising tide of abolitionists and others who believe that it's time for slavery to go. So what we have here with the Dred Scott case is a horrible miscarriage of justice, and we have essentially uh, another... Uh, I guess you could call it um, escalation of the slavery issue leading up to the Civil War. All right, let's talk about Buchanan's foreign policy. During Buchanan's presidency, a man named William Walker continually tried to establish new territories in Central America. With a group of men and supporters, he even managed to briefly establish himself as the president of Nicaragua. This is an interesting story. I don't know much about this. I should research this one more. However, he was driven out by force, and he fled back to America. Walker was strongly supported by Southerners with the hope he would spread slavery further south. Britain took a strong interest in Central America at the time. Buchanan repeatedly sent the U.S. Navy out to deter the British from establishing any colonies in the region. 
So again, this is the idea that, uh, hey, wait a second, this is our hemisphere, not yours, right? So there we have the foreign policy of Buchanan. When I'm looking at these presidents, I am looking squarely at the domestic policy. These cards are clearly the most important. The most important things happening right now are in the United States. There is so much happening with respect to slavery, the Missouri Compromise of 1820, the Compromises of 1850, Bleeding Kansas. All of these things are leading up to our next president, our 16th president, who would be, oh, get this open, who would in fact be the first president from this new anti-slavery party, Abraham Lincoln. So the next sets of presidents that we're going to be talking about will include discussion of the Civil War, it will include uh, discussion of the attempt at Reconstruction, and things are going to get really, really um, tragically interesting with the Civil War. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation on Presidents 11 through 15. Don't forget to fill out those Presidents cards. I would highly recommend that during this time period uh, for these Presidents, 1845 to 1861, we really focus a lot on what's going on with the domestic policy and thank you all for listening and have a great day.